when the internet was constructed in the 1970s to link scientists at different universities, usefulness was the priority, not security. Tsumu Shimomura came to national attention when he was asked by the FBI to help find a wanted computer criminal, Kevin Mitnick. The FBI had been searching for Mitnick for some two years. His crime allegedly including stealing millions of dollars worth of information from government, corporate, and university computer systems. The story of Shimomura's chase is told in this new book, Takedown, and we're pleased to have him here. It was written with John Markoff, who is a reporter for the New York Times, who's been covering Silicon Valley. Welcome to the broadcast. Very much. Pleasure to have you here. Your home is sort of is is um, San Diego, but you're in a sense, and that's where you work. But you you do what? What is it you do? Well, in reality, what I'm really supposed to do is I'm a physicist. Right. Does computation research, theory of computation. So yeah. sort of physicist, mathematician. And how did you get involved so that somebody came saying, "There's one person we need to to get involved Actually, in this happened, chase to find out where Kevin Mitnick is." What happened was uh, Kevin or one of his associates, someone close to Kevin broke into one of my machines on uh, Christmas Day in 1994 in San Diego while I was out of town trying to go skiing. And <clears throat> a team of us, two or three of us actually, two of us flew back, there were other people present. We decided that we needed to analyze these machines to figure out how this breaking had been accomplished, what damage had been done. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, there really wasn't a whole lot of intent towards catching this guy, catching whoever had done it. It was trying to find what vulnerability had been used how this person broken in and how to fix our systems and hopefully everyone else's systems if necessary to prevent that from happening again. And so what did you do? And so we went back and basically playing detective. Uh, in the real world, you, we have detectives. Uh, they look at clues. They look for clues, physical clues usually, or other things that they can find, you know, footprints, fingerprints, hair, uh, you know, bloody glove, whatever right. the case may be. And then from that, they try to figure out what actually really happened. Here. It's, very, it's the same idea, but it's different because the clues are not nearly as obvious, or at least not as obvious as we might expect because we haven't been doing this for as long. Yeah. Uh, we have records that computers might have kept. We might have, you know, either intentionally or unintentionally, things that have been modified, things that have been modified and then covered up, things that have been changed. And maybe in some cases we can tell, even tell what had been moved and what had been removed. What was it? that drove him to break into your computer, which was his, in a sense, downfall? Um, we don't know for sure. Um, my best guess is that he knew that I do computer security research. This is one of the things I do, I've been doing for the last few years. He knew I was a researcher, and my guess is that he thought that I might have some information on my machines that would help him break into other machines. You have said to me, as you sat down here, that, that he's not the problem, mm -hmm. that there are other people out there who are much better than he is, and they pose what problem? The problem is, in the real world, we've had hundreds or thousands of years to get used to how secure something is. If you put something on your desk, you know how secure it is. If you lock your door, you have some gut feel for how secure something is. If you lock something in a safe or in a bank safe deposit box, yeah. you have some feel as to how safe that is. But in this world, we don't really have that feeling yet. Uh, often, that's, educa that's education. Sometimes we just don't know. So you might have someone is using some, a system that someone else said, oh, this is secure, or well, maybe even they weren't told it's secure, but well, wow, I can send my credit card number over this and buy things. It, do you believe we can be made secure? I believe we can. I believe we can be made, probably not perfectly secure, but we can make it a lot more difficult for people to subvert our systems, our networks, mm -hmm. and get data about us. But as we, it, does it become a, sort of a terrible cycle in which as soon as you develop a system or a, a system, a secure system, to impose security is designed, programmed. Along come people equally smart who devise a system to break, and then you've got to buy another system to, to cure. Go ahead, help me. What's the... In, in a way, we have, that's what we have things like laws for and codes of conduct. Right. Um, the idea is, you know, some people would say that in this electronic realm, if you can do something, you're entitled to do it. That's like my saying to you in this world, just because I can break into your house, I'm entitled to do that. Or saying, it's okay for me to break into your living room and take photos as long as I don't take anything. Uh, in the real world, we wouldn't put up with that. I don't see why we should put up with that. So we should make conduct. laws that it's, it's illegal to do break, but aren't there laws that say that now? There are laws that say that now. Uh, you know, there have been laws that say that for a long time. That have said that for a long time. The trick is to extend those laws, extend the ethics that we have now to cover these new situations, which I think are not really new. They're just sort of new manifestations. Yeah. Uh, how to 
and we need to convey to people that yes, these ethics, yes, the, the sense of right and wrong exists in this realm as well. And I think that's a very important part. That's, that's part of it. I want to come back to some of these broader questions by computers about the internet, but let me stay with the chase and I come back to where the yeah. take down the pursuit and capture of Kevin Mitnick. How did you do that? How did you get it? Okay, so the we spent several we spent a week or so analyzing data to figure out how the break had been done, and then things calmed down for a while. I wanted to go back and ski. I was anxious to go back and ski. It's sort of something I've been looking forward to all winter or all summer. And in any case, a trail showed up later after John Markov wrote some articles on the new attacks that were being used. Uh, some people responded with some information about my files having shown up. In particular, my files showed up at a service provider in Northern California, a place called The Well. Right. And it seemed that the site was still actively in use as a site for breaking into other sites. It was it turned out an electronic uh, tool chest, storage locker, right. where breaking tools were being stored and booty was being stored. Anyway, I sent up a student to investigate at their request. And a few days later, he called me back and said, well, I found lots of stuff here. I found stolen, I found your stuff. I found stolen goods. I found stolen operating system software from Sun Microsystems, Silicon Graphics, uh, Motorola, Qualcomm, so there's telephone source code, all sorts of stuff, all stuff of great commercial value. I'm in over my head. Come and help. Mm -hmm. And so I went up, and that's when the chase started in earnest, uh, being uh, February 6th. And we were trying to follow this digital trail, an electronic trail on the network, trying to figure out where this person or persons were coming from. It looked like a similar individual. Mm -hmm. And we continued, so we investigated, determined where information on this network was coming from on the internet, where information was coming to from on the internet to the site, mm -hmm. uh, went to the next site in line, which was Netcom Online Communication Services, San Jose, and determined that there's a particular user who matched our profile times, basically were comparing logs against detective work, mm -hmm. trying to match different clues together to figure out what happened. Found that this was a user who was dialing in pretty reliably to a particular dial-up port that Netcom ran in Raleigh, North Carolina. Okay. We got a track and trace order for their dial-up numbers, so we could learn who was calling and got that, discovered that the, tel the records actually didn't do us a whole lot of good because the phone switch had been tampered, it was garbage. Right. We managed to get around that. Uh, I had a hypothesis that Kevin Mitnick was involved after we saw some stuff in Netcom where the person we didn't know, whose identity we didn't know was complaining about us having, or about John Markov having put his picture on the front page of the New York Times. I called John and asked him, so whose picture have you put on the front page of the New York Times in the last couple of years? And he came back with one answer, Kevin Mitnick. We had a name at that point. Yeah. Uh, I'd had a suspicion that he might be using a cellular phone to dial in. And we were, by checking with the cellular companies and getting the right court-ordered paperwork, right subpoenas mm -hmm. and warrants, we were able to get records from the cellular company that would let us match things all the way back to the cellular system. And we were able to determine by looking at cellular records that Kevin was within about a one kilometer radius of a particular cellular station in Raleigh, North Carolina. So six days, five days into the investigation, I guess, six days, yeah, by the time it was six days, mm -hmm. uh, flew, I flew out to Raleigh and cellular telephone technician and I drove around Raleigh trying to hunt down the signal using some radio direction finding equipment. Right. It's a lot like trying to find a light bulb in the dark. Yeah. Uh, you go towards where it's brighter. Right, right. And that evening, after about half an hour, maybe an hour, about half an hour, he came online about half an hour after we were on site and ready. Uh, half an hour later, we had driven around his house. And then and, you called the FBI? Yeah, we called the right. FBI and took them a couple of days to get around to getting him. And then when he was arraigned, he turned to you and said what? He said, I respect your skills. What was interesting was I think he thought this entire thing was a game. Um, we were in the back of the courtroom, and he, when he was brought in, he was brought in manacled by the marshals. I think he'd spent a long night awake wondering how he'd been arrested. He'd been on the run for two and a half years almost. Mm -hmm. and, then some, and then somehow the FBI had come and knocked on his door. And he saw me in the back, and his eyes went wide. Yeah. And he saw John Markov, and he, rec he recognized both of us. And I think he suddenly realized what had happened. And also at that moment, I think it dawned on him that this wasn't a game, that there were very real consequences. He, he was being arraigned for a crime. Yeah, and he had been arrested again. Take down the pursuit and capture of Kevin Mitnick, awaiting trial in Los Angeles, or in Los Angeles, America's most wanted computer outlaw by the man who did it, Tsumo Shimomura. Uh, 
with John Markov, New York, with John Markov, who's a New York Times writer covering the Silicon Valley. I assume, is he still on that beat? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very, very much. much. We thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. <laughs>